Hi everybody, welcome back to LZDT WF channel. Here we have another CAD repair. This is the last of the four Zakaria Galaxia boards that have been sent for repair. Unfortunately, this board has been used as a part source to substitute the Cygnetics video ICs that failed on the other boards. It is also missing the CPU because I found yet another faulty S2636 video IC in its socket. The power input connector has a broken plastic part, but it's usable anyway. There are a few broken capacitors, but we'll check them later. The solder side looks clean with no evident damages. There is just one ceramic capacitor soldered right under one IC. Now, if you haven't watched the four previous arcade repair videos about these Zakaria ports, I suggest you to pause now this video and take some time to check them first. A lot of information about these unusual arcade boards and my test setup are described in those videos and won't be repeated in this one. All of them are linked in the description down below. The first thing I did when I started working on these PCBs was to check all the EEPROMs and the PROM of all the various boards. Some of them needed to be erased and programmed again. On this last PCB I found a bad color PROM, but of course I didn't have an unprogrammed compatible part in my spares. So I had to order a new old stock 82S130 IC. This one was made in 1975. And it could be programmed with no issues in 2022. Here it is the PROM in its new home in this Galaxia PCB. As we have seen before, this board has a few broken capacitors, like this one in the picture. And also this other one has a missing piece. This one too has lost some parts. Just for fun, I always measure the damaged capacitors before discarding them. This one should be 1000 picofarads, so it's probably still good. But of course it cannot be left in its place. Also this one is still measuring the correct capacitance, so the damage is only to the external epoxy layer. Anyway, here are the replacement capacitors installed. I have used the same temperature coefficient of the original when substituting this one. That's indicated by the red dot over it. It probably doesn't matter, but it's always good to use a replacement as close as possible. This one was just a supplied bypass capacitor, so anything with a similar capacitance will do the job. The last one was a film capacitor, not a ceramic one, so I've used a film replacement, only with a different epoxy casing. Now look at this. Most of the EEPROMs can be removed from their socket with only the fingers. So all these sockets need to be substituted, just like on all the previous boards. With great patience, all the old 24 pins sockets were removed and substituted with much better ones. For the moment, I haven't substituted the red 40 pins sockets. Let's first see if they are still good. Then I removed the layer of oxide from the power connector pins with fine sandpaper. As always, I now check the electrolytic capacitors ESR. This one is ok.
but this other one is definitely bad. The needle barely moves. And indeed, the LCR meter shows a very low capacitance. This one must be substituted. In my spare parts, I didn't find any axial capacitor, so I had to mount a radial capacitor in this funny way. Like one of the previous Galaxia PCB, even this one came with a black and white ROM set, identified by the BN written on some of the labels, as shown both versions on monochrome mode in the previous repair video. To complete the board, I populated the CPU socket, and borrowed back three PBI chips from the other boards. And first, I will try this board with my diagnostic ROM. So let's power on. Hmm, looks like the video sync signal is not working correctly. But if I move the clock chip in its socket... Here we go, that's another bad socket. So the clock chip socket have been replaced. Now the image is stable, but we have other issues. I can actually tell from this image that my diagnostic ROM is at least partially executing its code. The four black zeros that I've circled in red appear only after the diagnostic code accesses all the three S2636 PBI chips. The other things that appear on screen are instead generated by both the background character and color RAM and by the shell RAM, which is the one that displays the alien bombs, that are all those white segments we can see here. It seems like the CPU is not able to write to the background character RAM, that is made with a pair of 2114 static RAM ICs. So, first of all, I'm going to check the chip select and write enable signals on these two RAMs. Yes, indeed, the write enable signal is stuck high. As we can see here, the WBG signal is generated by a NAND gate in position 2H. So, let's check the inputs of that gate. P9 toggles. But yeah, pin 10 is stuck low. Now, on pin 10 goes the signal indicated as BRPI. Let's find out where it's coming from. I've spent a few minutes staring at the whole schematic, but the closest signal I could find is WRPI. I've then checked with the multimeter, and indeed, that's what goes into pin 10 of 2H NAND IC. So, let's check what happens on this IC now. The data input has activity. The clock input toggles too. But the output pin is stuck low, and this cannot be good. So that 74 less 74 has been replaced. And now the code can correctly write to the character RAM. The diagnostic reports issues on the color RAM, but that won't affect too much the game, so let's switch to the game boot ROM. Mm, we have several issues here. The star field is missing entirely. The top of the screen is shifting together with the aliens and it should instead be stationary. And of course, wrong colors on some characters. Now, the erroneous screen shift has been investigated already on a previous repair. The first suspect is a wrong ESH signal generated by the LS156 in position 4A. So I quickly checked that all its inputs were toggling and, since all of them looked good, I decided it must be a faulty LS-156. 
So it was replaced. And indeed, now the top of the screen is not shifting anymore. It is time now to check the star field generator. This simple tapped shift register cell random generator has been described in greater detail in a previous galaxy repair. Now I'm just going to check for any problem around the four integrated circuits inside the red perimeter in this schematic. And here we go. This output shows bad levels, the peak is less than 2 volts. So I replace it at 74 LS74. And the star field now works. Notice now these faint color lines in this area. This is a strange issue. And of course we still have the bad character colors. I have now connected the black and white composite video output, and here there are no faint lines. And I can also see the alien bones that move smoothly, so there is still lots to do on this board. Before investigating the strange issues, let's address the color RAM fault. Even this one seems to be quite common as a failure on these arcade PCBs. The two 2102 static RAMs at 3C and 1B were often bad, so let's check what we find now. Pin 12 is the data output, and this one clearly shows bad levels. Let's check the other one now. This one shows correct levels. The 2102 static RAMs have separate pins for data input and data output. The ASIP in position 1B was the one showing the bad levels, so it's likely bad. I have removed the old one and installed a spare IC. First of all, the faint lines are still present. The character calls are different now, but still not the correct ones. So I've decided to also substitute the other 2102 with a spare IC. This one was manufactured in 1976, well before this arcade PCB. Well, we still have the color lines, but now all character calls are correct at least. The next problem to address is the not so smooth movement of the bombs dropped by the aliens. These objects, called shells by the designers, are neither part of the background characters nor part of the sprites handled by the 2636 programmable video ICs. Instead, they are created by this circuit that uses yet another different pair of static runs. The 2101 is 256 words by 4 bits static RAM with separate input and output data buses. So I have installed back my diagnostic ROM and indeed it reports errors in the shell RAM. Every number following the B letter has a zero as first digit and some other number as a second digit. This means the errors are always on the lower 4 bits of the CPU data bus, so the faulty RAM is the one in position 3F. And so I have substituted the 2101 in position 3F with a good spare. And wow, the color lines disappeared now. Hmm, however, the alien's bomb still moves in a jumpy way. So it's interesting to understand what causes the color lines. I have now installed again the faulty 2101 IC. And I've switched the monitor to underscan. It appears that the faulty RAM is somehow generating this bright bar just under the visible part of the scan area, so the video circuitry is not functioning correctly as the beam gets closer to the bright bar. Here I replaced a good 2101. 
and if I switch to underscar now, there's no bright bar anymore and no interference near the end of the horizontal scan line. However, now we must really understand what causes the rather funny behavior on the alien's bombs. Well, actually, now we have another fault. The board freezes in a random way after warming up for some minutes. The first things to check in this case are the CPU data and the address buses. I start by checking the address bus buffers. And this input looks like it's floating. Now, Uter A pin 2 should be connected to CPU's pin 3, so let's check with the multimeter. We have no continuity, as I suspected. Let's try rocking it. Here we go now. So it's a bad socket. The old socket has been removed and a much better one has been installed in its place. And the game is now running fine for many minutes. It's time to resume investigating the alien bombs issue. Let's first understand how the bombs are displayed in this game. This is actually a quite clever secret in my opinion. First of all, we have two static RAMs for a total of 256 bytes. The address lines to the RAMs come from these two multiplexers that switch to the CPU address bus when the program reads or writes to them. Otherwise, the RAMs are addressed by the vertical video counters. This means that a different byte is addressed on every horizontal scan line of the screen area. The byte contained in the addressed location is loaded into these two cascaded 4-bit counters, right at the start of every scan line. The two counters are decremented by the screen dot clock, and when the counters reach zero, a white bomb is created on screen by the shell signal. This 74LS74 latch makes sure that only one bomb can be triggered on each scan line by disabling the LS10 NAND gate in position 8C after the first bomb is displayed. The latch is armed again at the end of the visible scan line by its asynchronous preset input. Simple but clever, isn't it? Now observe how the bombs appear to be an alternating pair when coming down. A fault like this would be really difficult to diagnose with the game running in a tracked mode, since the shell circuit is working only on few time intervals. However, I'm confident that my diagnostic ROM would catch an error like this if it was caused by a faulty shell run, so the problem must be in the surrounding logic. So I decided to write some more diagnostic code to exercise continuously the bomb display circuit that should allow me to probe around the various ICs to identify the faulty one. This short piece of code produces either a static diagonal line or a shifting diagonal line if player 1 button is pressed. Of course, I first tested my code on the MEM emulator. They haven't emulated correctly the actual bomb's color, but that doesn't matter much. Here is the static pattern on the faulty board. It shows very well the strange alternating bombs instead of producing just a diagonal line. And here is the shifting pattern. These pulsing bombs, I think, are normal because the code writes to the shell RAM during the screen active period. However, to be sure, I've tested the ROM on a working PCB too. The pulsing artifacts are indeed normal. 
However, even with this test program, I could not really identify any evident fault on the shell circuit I sees. Maybe I just didn't look carefully enough, but I surely spent quite some time looking at the scope screen. At this point, I was really going to pull one EC at a time to identify the bad one. But first, I decided to try piggybacking the TTL ICs to see if one of them maybe would give some different faults. After all, if we exclude the RAMs, there are only 7 other ICs involved, so it's a quick enough test to be done. For some reasons, the last one I've tried is the LS161 at 5G. But look at that, this is pure luck. So I pulled that LS161 and substituted it. And indeed, that fixed the fault. Finally, everything looks as it should. It's now time for a final test of all the game inputs and the various sounds. All is looking fine so far, so also this board can be declared fixed now. Eventually, all the PCBs were returned to the owner, and he sent me a few video clips after assembling back a cabinet. I hope this was an interesting video and that you learned something. If you have any questions, please use the comment section below. That's all for now, have a nice time and thank you for watching.